ask you the questions that I had prepared for the table. Some of them have already been answered, and the remaining 15 to 20 minutes uh, at the most, uh, we will open the floor to questions. What we have seen, and also as well as part of this process, and for those for the last years, is the total failure of the Spanish democracy. As a citizen that votes in Spain and from Barcelona, what we are witnessing is how it's collapsing, how uh, basic rights are not maintained. And for many of us, it has been one more reason to be willing to escape from this Spanish failing democracy instead of a democracy that should have nurtured and evolved and, and kind of flourish, it has done the opposite. So my question would be, what do you think is kind of, what are the reasons for such failure of democracy that instead of evolving from dictatorship and flourishing into a more evolved and more modern democracy, it has evolved towards the opposite and actually growing the gap with the European democracies? Thank you. Would like to take it? It is a very easy answer, that the Spanish nationalism. This is the, the only answer we can put on the table. The main ideology in Spain is Spanish nationalism, and a, a kind of Spanish nationalism that doesn't uh, believe there is uh, room for other nationalism uh, in, the, in the country. So they, they just uh, use the force to stop. Uh, other nationalism, believing they are the only ones. It's very funny that they say you are the nationalist, but if you take a look at any photo, they are full of Spanish flags. They, they are the anti-nationalist, full of Spanish flags. So my answer is very clear. The only reason is the uh, Spanish nationalism as the main ideological corpus of Spanish politics. Could I, could I come in there just as the, as the I mean, it, it, so, just by analogy with the, with the British situation, uh, so we had our Irish problem, okay? And the Irish problem had a very particular solution, uh, which allowed the, which, if the Irish problem had not been resolved in such a way, uh, which allowed the Irish to have a referendum on their own future, then there would have been no referendum in Scotland. It was resolved that way, not because I think of the innate humanity of the British state necessarily, because there was a lot of pressure and because there was actually another sovereign state which was uh, adjacent, the Irish state. So there could be a brokerage there in a way which was not the case in, in well, not obviously the case within the Basque country, etc., etc. My understanding of it, my, 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 in my reading of, the, of, of, of Spanish constitutional history, it might be completely wrong, you know, and I'm going out on a limb here. But my sense of it is that there have always been two interpretations of the 1978 Constitution. Right? One was a kind of redemptive one. This is, this is the Spanish state redeems itself after Franco, which I think was very nationalist. This is our redemption, this is a return to this, and we freeze. We, once we redeem that, it's, it's frozen. And the other was a regenerative one, which is that we have to start again after Franco. We have to regenerate our democracy. And my sense is that if we want to treat this as a genuine clash of ideas, rather than a clash of tribes, then it's a clash between a redemptive understanding of the Spanish, uh, Spanish state, which is nationalist, and a regenerative one, which is much more federalist. Yes, so um, I have a question for uh, Vicente and for Elisenda. Uh, first question is, um, what do you think, Vicente, as a journalist, can you hear me? Uh, as a journalist, what do you think is has been the role of the Spanish media uh, headquartered in Madrid uh, or, or outside of Catalonia uh, to create a state of mind or a state of opinion uh, against the uh, Catalan will of self-determination uh, or uh, have a referendum? And for Elizenda, um, one of the things that we, I think, Catalans tend to do is we tend to explain the benefits of independence for our population, right? What would be the benefits, the fiscal benefit, etc. But I think that it would be great if you as an economist can explain a little bit what it would be the benefits for other countries in the EU or even for Spain of an independent uh, Catalonia, right? Um, 
countries have interest, and I think that in the future, countries that may recognize an independent Catalonia will be when their interests are at stake, and it's positive for them, uh, an independent Catalonia. So I, as an economist, I will be interested to know your opinion about uh, this particular matter. Thank you. About uh, journalism, uh, it has been the, uh, a complete disaster because uh, especially some uh, media in Madrid that was regarded previously as uh, very uh, good newspapers, for instance, of AIDS, uh, and, and very professional and very state-of-the-art newspapers, uh, has been doing things that you cannot believe they, they, they are doing. Of course, the more conservative uh, newspapers or TV channels, you can expect that they don't have any kind of professionalism in a, in a so important question like this one. But even in this case, for instance, uh, some TV channels, Spanish uh, national TV channels like Antena 3, they do every night debates on uh, the Catalan politics, but never invited a Catalan politician supporting independence, which is a very strange way to do journalism. I think that is not only because of the nationalism, but in this case there is another factor, which is that all of them are in bankruptcy. Uh, and, uh, and they have a serious problem to keep them alive. And the, the only way they are keeping alive is by uh, granting some kind of favors from the state, even legal favors or money favors. And that's the reason, for instance, that that's, that's a, a pity, with, especially with El Baez, but uh, after the, uh, uh, the país have a, a problem now with John Carlin, which is one of the writers, well-known writer from, from El Baez English born, uh, he's the author of this, uh, the book that was based the film of, of Nelson Mandela, Playing with the Enemies. And he wrote an uh, article uh, at the Times, I think, in London, uh, criticizing the, the, the way the Spanish police behave on the referendum, and he was fired, automatically fired from uh, El Baez. And after that, there is some people that is realizing, wow, this is something really <coughs> hard happening. And it is not only with the Catalan <coughs> question of Baez that was regarded as a left uh, leaning newspaper. Now it's a very right conservative uh, newspaper. And the only reason I, I, I can imagine is this one. They, they, they are out of money, they need the spirit how to live. Uh, I think Carlin uh, was very critical, saying PP and Del Pais now are in bed together, something uh, uh, like this. And there's a couple of articles recently from Columbia uh, Journalism Review, very critical with the positions from, from a professional perspective, uh, on the position of the newspaper. But it, it's a pity because someone living in Madrid, if, if he doesn't read or hear something coming from Barcelona, you have an idea of the country that, that it is not real, it's absolutely fake. Hi, as for the benefits for other countries, particularly in Europe, I think that um, what the Catalans can, and linking it also with a professor from Edinburgh University, um, I think that um, country or a nation that is used already to share sovereignty is more likely to be a good actor in a construction, in a federalist construction of Europe than the big, large and traditional nation states that are much more reluctant to lose their powers, especially their fiscal powers. Um, I, I, I see uh, Catalonia as an actor in Europe being much more favorable to have a fiscal budget, a unified budget with transparent rules and subsidiarity and fiscal federalism than, than other countries such as France or Spain or Italy. Um, and as for the benefits for, for Spain, a Spain without Catalonia, no? I think it could be an opportunity for Spain to reform its uh, model of capitalism, its variety of capitalism this crony capitalism, very much focused in construction, in large infrastructures that are not productive, such as high-speed trains or, and others that are, have a, this special link with the, 
political powers and then lead to a lot of corruption and this culture of subsidies in some regions that haven't have been used to, to transform the productive activity in, in these regions. So, so I would see it as an opportunity, of course, a shock in the short term, but an opportunity in the mid term. Because I think that Spain has a lot of um, good um, economic um, um, possibilities that are not uh, well channeled. And the, 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 the fact of having the, uh, the Basque country, well, not the Basque country because it doesn't contribute really to the fiscal, to the fiscal budget of the Spanish state, but especially all the Catalonia, Balearica Islands, the Valencian um, country, its contribution is, is a kind of prevention of this reform. Hi, um, this is a question more for Pamela and Neil. It's probably, I don't know what the Catalan thinking will be. I'm sorry, I had to interrupt, but I think that other people would like to ask questions and we really are running out of time. Yeah, it's a different, it's a different uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, so my question is, uh, one of the things we were told by the Spanish side is that uh, in no other constitution there is a right that we are claiming. And they say like it's not in the German, not in the French one, not in the Italian, and not in the big constitutions. And they claim saying that as a as one of the big arguments. So I would want to understand that like, if with a with the same challenge in one of those countries, even in the U.S., what do you think is going to happen? How how would that be treated? Uh, what's that argument going to bring them? Like uh, it's not in other constitutions. Of course, it's not that under someone really proposes, not someone really makes all these like seven years that we're doing specifically asking for something, then you need to politically solve it. But how do you think, uh, for example, France, which had one, or Italy, or Germany, um, act uh, in this situation? Well, I think um, Neil uh, pretty much um, clarified that most major states um, have constitutions that don't allow secession. So that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of the competing visions of democratic legitimacy. You know, that's the one that is sort of clearest in our mind. It's based on um, uh, procedural liberal democratic institutions. Um, however much the Spanish government now is not necessarily following those, but it does have the legitimacy of the Constitution. But that doesn't mean that there, that the, um, the sort of uh, popular right to decide is not a legitimate form of, um, of uh, a, a claim to, you know, a claim to democratic rights either. I'm not saying it's easy to resolve those two things. Um, but I do think those are competing claims of legitimacy, legitimacy that when you have the case, uh, as you said, said, you know, that half the population is demanding that right, that the, the central government you know, has some kind of obligation to, to dialogue, right, of, of, what, of uh, what that means. I, again, I don't think it's an easy solution. And the United States, we already know what the United States did. Um, when uh, <coughs> states tried to secede, they started a civil war, right? Um, and, and, but, but just because there is that one form of democratic legitimacy in the Constitution doesn't mean that there's no obligation to dialogue and no obligation to find a solution. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would back that up. I would, I would say two things. I mean, it's, it's certainly the case. You know, and I have to say, I, I wouldn't be that confident that many other European states would necessarily behave <laughs> all that much better. But the, 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 uh, I think there are two forms of flexibility which are missing in the Spanish situation. One is flexibility within the constitutional structure. So you can have flexibility within the constitutional structure still short of secession. And of course, the, you know, the refusal of the, uh, the constitutional court uh, to accept the uh, statute of autonomy despite it having been accepted by, you know, both by the polit political parties at the centre and locally, is an example of a very, very inflexible reading of the Constitution. 
especially since the Constitution was the constitution of what you might call an asymmetrical democracy. Already it was understood that you know different autonomous regions had different projects, had different aspirations, had different capacities. And then to say, well, that can't happen. And also my understanding uh, within, within Spain is that there's a tendency now to the extent that people even talk about this, to try to impose a more symmetrical federal logic in saying that this cannot happen for Catalonia unless it happens for all the other autonomous regions at the same time, which again I think is, a, is an inflexible reading of the situation. But the second inflexibility is you can say we don't have secession, but you can also recognize that in international law there is a developing right, what's called a right to be taken seriously. Okay? And this comes from the Canadian Constitution, it comes from the famous Canadian Quebec case, where the Canadian Constitution was as inhospitable to secession as the Spanish Constitution is inhospitable to secession. But what the Constitutional Court said there was we have to look at global opinion. And global opinion says that when you have a sustained majority within a region over a period of time, then you have at least a duty to negotiate in good faith. That negotiation in good faith won't necessarily lead to secession, but you have a duty to negotiate in good faith. And it's a duty to negotiate notwithstanding what your internal constitutional structure says. I don't hear much of that in Spain. We have a very clear situation this uh, the, the last Sunday in Corsica. Uh, when uh, two years ago, main Corsican pro-independence and pro-autonomy parties won the elections in Corsica. The reaction of France was to call them very quickly to go to the Palais de l'Elysée to discuss with them what can we do in order to prevent an escalation of this conflict. So last Sunday they vote a new uh, institution for the whole island that changed and creates a very special status for course inside the France. That, that's the question. It, it, it's not you, the inflexibility is creating a major problem for Spain. It's not the solution. It, they, they are creating a problem, a more serious problem. Hi, uh, my name is Christina. Um, I went to Barcelona for the referendum actually. It was quite shocking and very upsetting. And um, oh, since then, because of all that has happened with the media, it seems like you cannot trust any normal media outlet. The things that you read are so confusing. So being here, I'm, I read Pila Web a lot and a lot of Twitter. So I have a, a, some questions about why the elections uh, of the 21st of December. Neil said that you, the EU has done nothing and I seem to think, and I'm not sure what I think, because you get information that is really not substantiated, that the EU had a hand on that election. Because if not, it seems really strange that such a short time after, now we have elections. I, if it's not because the EU said something to the effect, I mean, I, maybe I just want to believe that and that they will follow through, right? But it seems like then what? We're just going to vote and it's gonna, the same thing's going to happen? And my second question, uh, I'll be sent, is um, why, did the, why did they not go all together? Why didn't they ju just do a Junts pel Si with Puigdemont at, at the head? Because now I'm going home again to vote. And I think, OK, I've always been leftist and Esquerra Republicana, but I'm going to vote for the president. So why didn't they all go together? There are so many questions and so many theories and so many conspiracy theories. So if you guys could clear that up, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, on the fact that uh, election, uh, we have Mr. Rajoy in the Spanish Senate on Thursday, the, the, the week they, they uh, will launch the 155. On Thursday, Mr. Rajoy said, uh, we will have a direct rule on Catalonia for six, six months, and after that, we will talk about elections. And on Saturday, he came and said, we will have elections in 45 day, days. So it's really strange. And uh, it, 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 we can think that there is some kind of pressure, but I don't have any proof of this kind of pressure. The only thing I can say is really strange. But, but I, I cannot say this is the European Union, 
this is the IBEX, this is, I don't know, I don't really know. The only fact is that it's very strange. Maybe Elise said that. Uh, just answer the other, the other one. The second one is why the political parties supporting independence are not together in this election, I didn't understand. I think it was the logical step was the government you remove by force, we put again by vote, but that was not the decision of the political parties, and I, I'm not responsible for this. I, I, I'm only, I, I regret, and I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, as for the first question, I'm not sure, but it might also be that he thought that the resistance of the Catalan population and the Catalan institutions would be stronger than it, re than, than it really was. And then on the same Friday, thinking that we, the plans to resist in the, in the buildings of the, of the Catalan government would go ahead and that it would be difficult to impose, uh, to be in this situation for months, then he decided to, to call elections. This is another, another possibility. I'm t I tend to be a lot pessimistic uh, with the EU actions because uh, it's been such a disappointment. No? This, um, this, uh, resist, uh, this uh, of the whole, of the um, whole bunch of options, that he so precisely defined and intelligently defined, the fact that they decided to be in the last one, in the, the most conservative one, was very disappointing for a population in Catalonia that was traditionally very pro-European and very pro-EU. No? Um, so I, I tend to be in the pessimistic version and don't believe in the conspiracy theories that are more optimistic and say, yeah, it's the EU that is pressuring him to, to call elections. I prefer not to expect anything from the European Union. I think it's more realistic within uh, taking into account what happened. And as for the coalition, well, it's complicated. It, two years ago, already, Esquerra didn't want to do it. And, felt forced to do it and sometimes behind screens there has been some divisions. It has, I think it has negative things not for them not to be running together and it has also positive things in the sense that sometimes when things happen behind screens um, it's f easy for a party to accuse the other one because we don't know in reality. And if they all run with their program and it's going to be more transparent, who is taking which decision in, in what context? Maybe, I don't know. I don't want to defend the EU here, but I, I do think, I think there's something interesting going on. That I think we live in a period where there's very poor EU leadership. To some extent that's a structural problem, but I think it's also a personality problem. But I think there's, there is also at the same time more of a, if you, if you think, think back 20 years ago, there's more of a horizontal European political culture than there was. Uh, Spanish leaders are probably more likely to listen to other national leaders if they say things sotto voce, whether it be Macron or Merkel or even May. But, it's, uh, <laughs> but I think there is more of a conversation there. And I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't rule out the fact that a lot of things were said quietly. You know, across that, but I think it would be far more, so to some extent that's, that, that, that is an indication of a European culture which would not exist without the EU, but it's not a sign of EU political leadership. Slight further escalation of the problem might have uh, induced deeper intervention from uh, the EU. So for example, Mr. Macron, in a conversation with, I believe was a uh, Daniel Cohn-Bendit made some really weird comment around, you know, there's been some police brutality, but really, like, this isn't really that grave, and, you know, they, they could have seen it as a sort of an over, overreach of police action rather than a, a, a strategy from the, from the, a, a, a strategy of intimidation from the, from the, uh, from the Spanish state, and, and whether, you know, another event like that would have made it more obvious that, that this is a real issue. Uh, and so why do you think the Catalan leadership didn't pursue that? And uh, I know this is a very hard question and it 
wrench in my heart to have to ask it, but uh, maybe you have some insight on it. Well, my, I'm just giving my personal opinion because we all follow the situation not from the inside of the boards that were deciding, no? the committees, the, the, the executive, the, the government and the political leaders. And What I think is that violence, extreme violence, could be a threat, but not a realistic thing that could happen. Because it, listening to these European leaders, for instance, Manuel Valls, former leader, not a leader anymore, but uh, he was a prime minister for France. He went to a radio in Madrid and he said, oh, there were not deaf people. Okay? That was his comment on it. So, and, the, and that links with Macron's in this debate with Convendit, no? Well, don't exaggerate, it was police beating, but that happens uh, when the when there's a demonstration because the G25 meets or whatever, no? Um, so I think that something that couldn't, ha was not realistic to happen is the police or the shooting people. Another type of violence happening, um, similar to the one that happened on the referendum if people had decided to protect the Catalan institutions from, from the Spanish police going to detain the ministers or the president, we could have the images of the 1st of October repeated. Um, that could have happened. Another thing that could have happened would be, and the coup said that, to provoke some violent, false flag violent actions. This also, I think it's realistic. But I don't think it's realistic to think that they could have fire, um, um, shoot um, people directly. If something prevents that from happening is the EU and the fact that the Spanish democracy now belongs to the European Union. So I don't know. They decided in the, they thought, but that happened very early. Uh, on the 10th of October, I was in the Catalan Parliament, and there were already rumors that some of the leaders of the PDCAT were saying that no, oh, there will be deaf people, we cannot go ahead with that. Um, that was something that started like becoming a factor in their decision. I have no clue of the fact that if they had some information that would be... Maybe, yes, they had information of troops moving, or um, applying the 116 article of the Spanish Constitution, which, which is the siege state. Uh, uh, France has is, has been for one year in the in the in the siege. We say it siege state in the state of siege, no? Um, being in the state of siege doesn't mean. Um, Bullets. It means that the army has more power. I don't know really. Well, as a journalist, I must say that in conversations with members of the government, they told me that they have serious threats, uh, even to their own lives. Uh, but I don't have any proof that in other than the words they told me, so I cannot say there were a threat. What I can say is that clearly some members, important high ranking members of the government, they told me that they have proofs of some activities that lead by, not only by the official police, by, by, by paramilitary groups, etc., threatening the, their lives, and there is a fact which is that the, uh, the bubble that surrounds the president was changed that very same week. And uh, uh, it was increased a lot with uh, snipers and uh, helicopters. And uh, it was very unusual uh, amount of force surrounding the president these days, which we can understand that means that the threats were credible. But I don't have any proof of that other than the words of, of them. You, you must understand also that this is a very difficult situation because they are in jail or in exile. It's very difficult to talk with them and to contrast 
information with them today, so I'm, I'm sure that maybe next year we will know a lot about what happened, but uh, that was the case. Uh, I think that, that the, there were also paternalistic understanding. They, they didn't allow the population to defend the Catalan Republic, and I think that was wrong on, on, on his side, but I can understand the feeling. Uh, it's, it's, it's very easy to talk here in this chair, and not being in the chair of the president or the vice president, and say maybe if I say to the people who go to the streets, they kill one or two, because be, be, to be honest, in October the 1st there were no deaths, but there could be more deaths. Uh, it, it was just a factor of, of, of lacking. So, so I, I don't know, um, it, it, and it is relevant to me also that the fact that the, this generation of politicians decided to carry themselves the burden of this thing, going to exile, to prison. Uh, I don't agree with them. I think that, that was not the right decision, but they decided that people in the streets were defending the, the power boxes and the democracy. Now we will carry the burden of, the burden of, the, of this by going to prison of to exile, which is something that I respect very much. Before we move to the next question, I want to confirm that we have the very time. last question. Okay, last question. Uh, well, I have two questions. No. <laughs> <laughs> One is that so we are a Catalan community here that we meet, we are in contact, we organize events, we organize demonstrations. There was a, a, a document written, so we distribute that document for academic people to sign it. I would like to know if you have any more suggestions of things that we can do from here in order to, to help to the situation to the situation. That's a question. And the second one is uh, well I feel that we are pretty alone in all as a Catalan people. Um, I don't expect any help from anyone from the European Union or from any other country. So um, I was wondering if uh, maybe taking more direct action would uh, move things to a different direction, like more directly, like just a general strike. We stop everything. Catalonia falls, Spain falls, the European Union falls, and then somebody will be able to sit on the table, and, and then maybe things will move forward. So, what do you think about taking more direct actions, general strike, or whatever it can be that? Since the population really moves, you know, with our politicians, and we really do something that makes things fall, and then uh, we can just sit down at a table face to face and then we can talk. Okay, so I propose that this very last question, I mean, there's two questions. The first one uh, can be answered by anybody who wishes to, but I propose that the second part of the question be answered in turn by everyone at the table, and then we close the session. <laughs> I, um, I, I think this is partly a question of generation, of age, but I am very worried about um, a strategy to tear everything down and think you're going to sit at the table and construct something without a lot of death and destruction in between. Um, and looking, but I don't see where you sat down. <laughs> oh, there you are, right. <laughs> um, you know, I, I was an anarchist as a, um, you know, as a graduate student, and I still defend many of those principles, but watching the results of revolutions over you know, various generations as a historian. Um, you know, the, I, I, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not as optimistic about the results, right? Of kind of tearing everything down to um, to the ground and starting over. Yeah, I think um, such direct actions that tend, that are meant to affect the economic activity and and have an impact on the risk premium of the Spanish economy and then have an impact on the EU um, have to be very well thought. 
and have to be in accordance with, with, the, with the political actions and decisions. What I mean is that, for instance, the general strike that took place in the, on the 3rd of October was a very, in, 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 was a very intelligent movement. After the referendum, after the violence by the police against the referendum, um, this kind of collective protest that was a country collective protest and the fact that most of the country was paralyzed and then it was also a showing of force, of control of the territory, was adequate in that precise moment and should have been, in my opinion, accompanied by a declaration of independence quite early, uh, quite close to this, to this day. The delaying it, expecting a negotiation that never happened, only, 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 only provoked a, a, a pessimism and, and gave time to the Spanish government to react, gave time to the Spanish government to organize the decree for the moving of the legal headquarters, to start the economic campaign of threats. Um, but that said, I think that at present, we, there was another strike organized to protest for the, for the, for the detentions and the arrest and the jailing of the leaders. Uh, but just to organize a general strike out of nothing, thinking that it's going to affect, I think it's negative. Because it's going to hurt us more than the others. Because uh, the fact that, um, that uh, some, some of our people that could be favorable to independence, uh, the second strike, they, they, most of them, they, they open their shop, shops because the restaurants because they cannot afford a second day of losses. Um, so um, these kind of actions should be used very wisely and in accordance with the, with the political general actions and, and not thinking that doing that we are going to, 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 to obtain a result and a, probably what, what happened if we start doing this type of actions and it's not coordinated or it's not in the right moment is just um, um, written, uh, a reduction of the movement, uh, an externalization of the movement and more people getting um, yeah, apart from it because it's, it's hurting them, themselves economically. I will forego for a moment my role as moderator. <laughs> I, I meant it when I said everyone at the table, so uh, I'll take the privilege. Um, and I think that I'll try to answer both questions in one, uh, because you asked what can be done, what can we do. I, be I believe that uh, states eventually uh, crumble after a long period of very gradual illegitimation, and when that situation is right, then everything happens very quickly. Uh, you know, look at the, the end of the ancien regimes, Europe, look at the, uh, the end of the Soviet Union. Nobody expected it, but when, when things began moving, they moved very, very quickly. And it could not have happened without a long period of preparation. I think that in the current situation with the Spanish state, much of the brutal reaction has to do with a very intense fear that the state is coming to a point where it's not no longer going to be tenable. Um, the, one of the main lines of defense is, of course, trying to legitimize the independence movement in Catalonia. And one of the ways that this is being done, aside from others, is insisting on, on the question of numbers. It's, it's only a part of the population. It's less than 50%. Now, little by little, the more the state acts in this way, the more it not only legitimizes itself, because it begins to be less and less recognized by people within Catalonia. But it's beginning to uh, create by itself the majorities that the independence movement one day will have. And when that is there, when that happens, nobody, either in the media in Madrid or uh, in the European Union, is going to be able to continue to deny that reality. And at that point, a political solution will immediately emerge, it will come to the fore. Yeah, I mean, I think I, 
I think I agree with that. <laughs> I, th I think I think the it's you know compared to the to the UK, you know, and and the and I I don't think the UK state is in any less vulnerable situation than the Spanish state. You know, this morning. Uh, Brexit negotiations break down, and so we have a government which you know cannot uh, persuade its Northern Irish contingent uh, to go along with the agreement which will avoid a hard border. If they do persuade them, the Scots will turn around and say we want the same economy, and so the whole thing becomes kind of three-dimensional chess, which at a certain point actually stops working. You know, and uh, I think I think that's a dilemma because. The, the political solution, the right political solution, might lead to the breakup of the state, and the wrong political solution might lead to the breakup of the state as well, but for, for the wrong reasons. So you, you can't really. I mean, one thing I would say is that I think the 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 I didn't really have time to develop this point, but I think the, the it's one thing for I don't think the EU is well set up to respond effectively to a one-off failure of constitutional propriety, right? I think if this happens again, I think if they fail again, you know, I think if there is a continuing clear majority of, 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 of people in Catalonia who want the right to decide at least, and that continues to be resisted, I think at some point there will be much stronger intervention by the EU. I think that's inevitable. I think also the Presumably, somewhere down the line, the, the, the Spanish state could accept that, but would not accept it just as a, a, a right to decide on the part of the, of the Catalan people. It would insist that it was a Spanish right referendum. And of course, they, are, they themselves, they've created a situation where they've created a kind of tribal dichotomy on either side of this, you know. But one thing I would say there is, going back to the, to the, to, to the, to the uh, Canadian situation, is that the right to self-determination in international law is not necessarily a right to sovereignty, right? There's two rights. There's a right to external self-determination, which is a right to sovereignty, and there's a right to internal self-determination, which is to say that short of sovereignty, then if the people within a particular part of the state believe robustly enough in the autonomy of that state, then there should at least be significant constitutional uh, 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 concessions by the state itself. So, in other words, if the Spanish state ever did say, yes, you can have your referendum, but, but it's going to be a bad Spanish referendum, that wouldn't necessarily be a pretty victory for Catalan nationalism, because provided there was still a majority within Catalonia, I think that would at least that would provoke the, the internal right of self-determination and would require the Spanish state to, to, to at least make significant concessions. So I do think there's, there's still scope, there's still hope, I don't think it's a completely zero-sum game in all of this, but uh, uh, there has to be a movement, there has to be a movement from the Spanish state, and I think that to some extent will have to be provoked by, by the wider European political culture. I understand people who is sad because of what happened in, in October, but I'm not. I, I think uh, uh, this is not uh, correct to uh, not understand how far we reach, uh, how close we are. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, as this is a gradual movement, it will regenerate itself. Uh, maybe uh, the actors that we have today, political parties, the, the, the organizations, are not the good ones for the next period. If this is something happening, I, I have not heard that at all. Something new will uh, come up. and. Uh, uh, will change the situation again uh, in favor of the uh, independence uh, process, especially because we are not alone. It is, it is not true we are alone. I just, yesterday night when I arrived <coughs> to the hotel room, uh, CNN was uh, on, on the TV and, and the, the, uh, on this rolling uh, street, uh, so Mon said, and they didn't even say president of Catalonia, president, <laughs> nothing, Puigdemont. Uh, so there is a, a a kind of globalist uh, elite in the world that understand that is the, they, they even knew the name of the president of Catalonia. Think about it, five years ago, nobody knows who was the president of Catalonia or what, 
was Catalonian today, we were not alone in this, in this way. And the cynicism of the, of the political elites in the world, we learned so much time ago that can turn uh, on every direction. What Mr. Rajoy didn't know yet is that uh, even Mr. Juncker can be seen with him also. Yes. It only depends on the, what's the most interesting uh, thing for them. So I, 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 don't, I, I don't agree on, on these sad uh, people that, that think uh, we are alone, etc. We are not alone. We, uh, and even being alone is not a problem. <laughs> a serious problem. It, it, yeah, it's, it's much more difficult, but it's not a serious problem if you are confident in your people. And I must say that after the detentions, after being the people in jail, the massive demonstration in Barcelona, to me, was something absolutely unexpected. I never saw so much people, I never saw so much people so decided to fight. So, um, at least in my opinion, I keep my faith in my people. I think Catalan people will uh, continue to, to fight. And frankly, uh, I'm confident in Spain. Uh, they will not change. So they, they, they are, they, our country, we change our country from the bottom up, but with the help of a Spanish uh, a state that didn't understand uh, they are using the wrong way. So let's Spain follow the path. <laughs> So thank you very much for having come here and resisted to the very end. Um, uh, this is oh, the first question. Well, I tried to. Uh, would you like? Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Keep doing that. I um, I think that um, even if political leaders such as Macron or Juncker or Angela Merkel, uh, it's important civil societies in in in, the, in their states. If civil society changes, then the leaders adapt. So it's very important to, to keep on having this context in academia and explaining the situation and um, extending it and making the manifestos be, being signed, explaining the vulneration of fundamental rights and, um, and keep on doing that. And also try to organize things by yourselves, no? Like, like public lectures or things that, and try to, to invite um, non-Catalans to, to them. Thank you.